This thing is fast. Mayday, mayday, is there anybody who can help me, help me? I don't think my heart is working lately, lately. I can hear it calling for you, yeah, you, yeah. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to another video. So I bit the bullet recently and I picked up a new workhorse computer for my setup the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the 38 core M2 Max chip. So I've been using this as my main work computer for both content creation and my day job as a software engineer. And I've transitioned to using my PC for, well, gaming. So my MacBook Pro is the 16 inch version with the 38 core M2 Max chip. And I also added a four terabyte SSD and 64 gigs of the unified memory. I want to quickly talk about why Apple Silicon is so fast. First, the M1 and M2 chips were custom designed by Apple, allowing them to optimize it for their devices and software. The chips are manufactured using advanced technology, which improves performance while consuming less power. By integrating multiple components onto a single chip, Apple Silicon enables faster communication and overall better performance. Second, they boast powerful processors for quick computing and graphics capabilities for tasks like gaming and video editing. Additionally, a dedicated neural engine enhances machine learning tasks. Now, Apple Silicon is designed to be energy efficient, providing good performance without draining the battery quickly. The tight integration with macOS ensures optimized performance and seamless operation. Overall, these factors contribute to Apple Silicon speed and efficiency in Mac computers. Now, one thing I wanna to touch on in a little bit more detail is the unified memory architecture. Unified memory architecture combines the RAM and processor, which means data can transfer faster compared to traditional memory systems. In regular systems, the data stored in RAM is accessed by the CPU, which relies on wires to transfer data. This can cause bottlenecking on the amount of data that is sent to the CPU. Apple Silicon uses the same substrate layer for mounting the RAM and the SOC, allowing the RAM to connect to the chipset using silicon connections. This means that Apple Silicon-based MacBooks have their RAM baked into their package directly. This allows for quicker data transfer between the RAM and the processor. As a result, Apple's unified memory has a higher data bandwidth, which is great. Apple also changed how the CPU and the GPU access the memory system, which makes things a lot more efficient. But I won't continue to bore you with further details. Suffice to say, Apple has done some great things here. The 16 inch MacBook Pro has a retina display with True Tone technology, XDR, a contrast ratio of 1 million to 1, a peak brightness of 1600 nits for HDR content, and a maximum refresh rate of 120 hertz with that ProMotion technology. The screen looks beautiful at a max resolution of 3456 by 2234 with a PPI of 254. Oddly, it's important to note that 1600 nits of peak brightness can only be achieved in temperatures less than 25 degrees Celsius. The screen can output up to 500 nits of peak brightness for SDR content. The laptop ships with three Thunderbolt 4 ports, an HDMI 2.1 port, an SD card slot, a headphone jack, and the MagSafe 3 port for that sweet 140 watt USB-C charger that ships with the 16 inch version and ultimately can charge this MacBook from zero to 100% in just over an hour. As a creator, I love having that SD card slot for easy video transfer when editing videos. It just makes the entire process so much easier. The Thunderbolt 4 ports are great, especially for one cable charging, data transfers, and video signals. I picked up the CalDigit TS4 to pair with it, and these two in conjunction allow me to easily pair my laptop with all of my peripherals and my external monitor. Note that I have the CalDigit TS4 connected to a USB switcher where my mouse, keyboard, and speakers are in order to switch contacts between my laptop and my PC. Let's talk external displays for a moment. As a software engineer and creator, I value having that external monitor for all of my tasks. 
The 2023 14-inch MacBook Pro and 16-inch MacBook Pro models with the M2 Max chip can support up to four external displays at once, depending on the number of monitors, can support up to 8K resolution and a refresh rate of up to 240Hz per each display. This is great news as many software engineers love their external displays. A lot of them secretly, including myself, kind of trying to look like Tank from the Matrix. Now currently, HDMI 2.1 only supports 4K at 144Hz. However, the fact that the new MacBook Pros can support up to 240Hz means that the new MacBook Pros support DSC or VESA Display Stream Compression. By using Display Stream Compression, it's now possible to boost the bandwidth up to 128 gigs per second in order to deliver high definition video while also boosting resolutions and frame rates. With DSC, it uses the latest technology to enhance videos, including the color depth, which leads to a fantastic image. Now, if it's possible and within your means, I definitely would recommend pairing your MacBook Pro with a high quality monitor that supports a high refresh rate. Now in my case, I use the LG 32GQ950, which is a 4K 32 inch monitor with a max refresh rate of 160 Hertz on the fast mode, but normally I usually keep things, even when PC gaming, to 144 Hertz. Now if you're interested in learning more about the LG 32GQ950, I did do an in-depth review of that monitor and I'll link that down in the description below. The battery life on the 16 inch MacBook Pro is insane, especially with the M2 Max. It averages around 18 hours and 56 minutes of battery life on average. Well, why is that? Well, the M2 Max has faster efficiency cores compared to previous generations, better temperature management resulting in less fan usage and better battery life, and improved load balancing that balances the workload across the cores instead of ramping up specific cores. Now, according to some tests I've read, when exporting a 40 minute 4K video, the M1 Max, for example, used 80% sustained GPU power across its cores, while the M2 Max did so with 60%, reducing power draw and contributing to increased battery life. The 140 watt charger can charge the laptop from zero to 100% in just over an hour from what I personally observed. That's absolutely insane. That means that for long coding or video editing sessions, I don't even need to consider charging the laptop, which also means that if I'm going out, depending on where I'm going for the day, I may not even bring the charger with me. It's that good. The laptop comes with a 1080p webcam, which actually looks decent for Zoom calls. Now, no camera will ever make the low angle on my face ever look like a good choice, but other than that, it works great for any meetings that I need to take. Lighting is always half the battle with any camera, so if you're in a well-lit room, it looks quite good for a built-in webcam. As a software engineer, I can confidently say that the Magic Keyboard of the MacBook Pro is fantastic. It's super easy to type on and write code. The 16-inch MacBook Pro has 78 keys, including 12 function keys and four arrow keys arranged in a T-shape. It also features a Touch ID, a sensor that detects ambient light, and a trackpad that can sense pressure. This allows you to click harder or softer, draw with different levels of pressure, and use multi-touch gestures to control the cursor more precisely. The 16-inch MacBook Pro boasts a high-fidelity six-speaker sound system with force-canceling woofers, wide stereo sound, and support for spatial audio with Dolby Atmos on the built-in speakers. The 3.5mm headphone jack offers advanced support for high-impedance headphones. Simply put, the sound quality is awesome. These features make the laptop ideal for listening to music while coding or during long video editing sessions. Apple Silicon makes a significant difference in more intensive tasks such as editing high resolution videos. Performing actions like clicking around in the timeline, video playback, applying effects, color grading, and exporting videos is incredibly fast. 
Even exporting something like ProRes 422 for a 10 minute video happened so quickly that the first time I did it, I thought it was a joke. Hey guys, Thomas from the future here. I'm currently editing the video that you're watching and when I heard myself say that that export went so quickly I thought it was a joke, I wanted to go back and see how long it actually took. So I re-exported the same video again and what I found is for a 4K video that's nine minutes and 21 seconds long, to export that in Apple ProRes 422 took roughly one minute and 38 seconds. It actually took more like one minute and 36 seconds because I didn't hit the stop in time, but let's just say for all intents and purposes, one minute and 38 seconds to export a nine minute and 21 second video in Apple ProRes 422, which is like a 31 gig file. I have nothing else to say here. Combined with the 16 inch XDR display and great battery life, this is undoubtedly a beast of an editing machine and currently nothing else comes close in portable laptops. When it comes to portability, the 16 inch laptop size doesn't feel too cumbersome to me. It easily fits inside my everyday carry bag and I find it easy to transport when I go to co-working spaces or work from a cafe. Although it's heavier than the 14 inch model, it's still a decent option for people who need to work on the go. Additionally, the large trackpad on the 16 inch MacBook Pro is great for video editing when you're away from the office. Finally, for doing other tasks like watching Udemy videos and coding along with the instructor, the 16 inch screen size is good enough and I enjoy having that extra bit of screen real estate to split things up versus the 14 inch model. For multiple buffer windows and Vim, it works nicely too and the XDR display makes code look vibrant. Now, early on, the ARM architecture of the Apple Silicon chips were an issue for a lot of programmers, including myself. At a previous company that I worked for, we began to give our new hires the Apple M1 MacBooks, which were new at the time, and they immediately started causing some strange issues in our development environment. Some of our NPM packages at the time were incompatible with ARM, and we had to do some weird things to mitigate the issues, but it also caused some immediate development problems booting up local dev, which took ages to debug. Now, luckily, a website called called Does It Arm shows if certain apps are compatible with Apple Silicon, but it really isn't much of an issue anymore. Most developers that I work with now are in Apple Silicon, so things have definitely improved compatibility wise since a few years ago. I've been a professional software developer for over a decade, and I've primarily used macOS as my main development environment. MacOS is of course based on Unix, which is synonymous with stability and security, making macOS a popular choice for developers. I know there are a lot of Linux fans out there, please don't hate me, I like Linux too. MacBooks also have a great keyboard, in my opinion, and now more recently have great battery life and an awesome screen, so the MacBook is a great platform for developers. Now, while Apple Silicon architecture is fast and efficient and speeds up development tasks such as writing and compiling code, running Docker containers, etc., it's not necessary for programming. Now, let's be honest, generally speaking, most development tasks don't need a whole lot of power to do, at least power that lies in the M1 and M2 generation chips. Now, don't get me wrong, does it make things nicer and faster? Yes, but again, it's not necessary. Now, if you write code or tinker with development for fun, you don't need the M2 Max. You don't even need any type of Apple Silicon chip. However, if you do this professionally, saving time can make a difference to your bottom line. Ultimately, whether you should buy one or not just depends on the context. The real question is, who is the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M2 Max chip for? Honestly, unless you're doing things like 4K or 8K video editing or graphics intensive tasks like 3D rendering or modeling, the chip is probably not gonna be worth it for you. For me personally, I work daily with 4K footage for this channel and export times do make a difference to my workflow, so I opted for the Max. Now, if you work strictly as a software engineer who relies on their computer daily to get their work done, the M2 Max is overkill. 
In fact, the M2 Pro is also likely overkill. From everything I've heard from coworkers, the M1 Pro would be the most cost efficient choice that will still drastically decrease development task times. Now, if I just use this computer for basic tasks, casually browsing the web, but I wanted a newer laptop, I'd probably just go with the new 15 inch MacBook Air with the M2 chip as in my opinion, it's the best bang for the buck. I'm gonna be talking more about this computer in subsequent videos as I get to know it better. And just to be clear, I'm not strictly an Apple guy and I'm not strictly a PC guy. I just like technology and working with computers and I like using the tool that makes the most sense to use at the time. But for gaming though, I'm still a PC gamer at heart. Anyway, that's all I have for this one, guys. If you're still here, please drop me a MacBook down in the description below, just so I can give you a like for sticking around until the end of the video. If you like this video, please hit that like button and please consider subscribing and also hitting that bell icon so you know when I release more videos. I've got more tech, desk setup, and gaming content planned as usual, so please stay tuned for that. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya. Mayday, mayday, tell me you'll come home and be my baby.